All right. All right. Now everyone can probably hear me. All right. Good. Getting all the bugs out. The first lecture. Uh, all right. So, uh, well, thanks for coming. And this is the beginning of the NIH summer course. Uh, we had it several years ago before COVID. We sort of stopped stopped it during COVID, and now we're starting it up again. And uh, and this is the schedule. Um, okay. Uh, so this is the schedule. And not that most of you have can access this. It's, it's online. It's on Google Drive. And I also sent you a copy of it, but I can give you other, like we'll distribute this multiple times. And uh, just to quickly go over the schedule, uh, we basically are having lectures either here or in a classroom around here, 206, 209, 207, um, anywhere around this area, uh, every Tuesday and Thursday at two o'clock. And we'll have it throughout the entire year or the, throughout the entire summer up until September 12th. And uh, we'll be not having it during OHBM, which is uh, you know, during June 26th, 27th, and also July 4th, of course, uh, for the July 4th holiday. But everything else will be filled with And it's not something you have to sign up for. It's not something that there'll be any tests. It's just a bunch of lectures, actually. And um, uh, uh, so, so the topics will mostly be uh, functional MRI, uh, especially at the beginning. But then, you know, some will will go into uh, looking at uh, just more general topics, like looking at brain behavior connections with uh, correlations with fMRI, or uh, towards the end, towards uh, August, there'll be lectures on um, uh, MEG. Uh, there's one or two at least on EEG. Uh, EEG either by itself or with uh, within uh, the scanner. Um, uh, within the fMRI scanner, and other ones, sort of general ones on on image processing and fMRI time series processing. Uh, we, you know, it was hard to fit all the topics, and so I think what we'll probably do is once this course is over, we might take a short break, but we also might uh, continue some version of this lecture on throughout the year, maybe once a week or something like that, and uh, just to keep things going. And and we'll all these talks will be recorded as they are now and. Uh, posted online on the Functional MRI Facility website and also on YouTube. Uh, uh, I don't know how quickly that will happen right after the lecture, but um, uh, we'll try to get it up there as soon as we can. So, and of course, if you have any questions, you can email me. Uh, you can email Dorian, who sent out the last uh, uh, invite. Uh, between the two of us, we should be able to get, or Pete Malfi's and Ibrib Chan Singe, who's also been helping out. So. All right, um, this lecture is gonna be a very, very, very brief uh, and uh, abbreviated version of like the history of brain mapping, brain imaging. Uh, and I just kind of pretty much wanna go over five uh, areas. One is the really old days of where things were just based on lesion-based mapping, then sort of early developments in anatomic imaging, uh, then uh, hemodynamic and metabolic imaging, electrophysiologic imaging, and then finally functional MRI. So uh, we should get through this pretty pretty rapidly. So uh, I'll go only as far back as here and only use a few examples. Uh, the first sort of indication that, uh, uh, you know, there are many indications before this, but the and it, there's some really good books that talk about this, uh, uh, but uh, this is actually where I wanna start. Like, late 1860s, 1860 with Paul Broca. Uh, he actually has a famous area called Broca's area. And basically he had a patient that could only produce the word tan. They found out that he had a massive lesion uh, right here in his frontal lobe. So he realized, well, this area is important for uh, producing, producing words. Um, they could understand words just fine, but they couldn't produce them. So, so that was the earliest way that uh, we were starting to get clues about where in the brain uh, function was important. And of course, there's also Wernicke's area. His patients couldn't understand or produce meaningful speech, but they could articulate words. And so, so you have Broca's area for articulation, but then Wernicke's area is right here. His patients had le lesions right there. So, so essentially, 
And there's all kinds of work like this. People had their visual cortex taken out and, uh, by some sort of accident, or uh, uh, they would have a clear deficit in function. Um, you also had uh, people like Phineas Gage, who, who had a, a spear that uh, he was a famous patient. Uh, uh, it wasn't really patient. He actually recovered almost completely. He had a spear through his frontal lobes. And there was no obvious deficit, but um, he started having, he started making very bad decisions in life and uh, uh, sort of changed his personality. So that's seen, there's certain parts in the frontal lobe that they learned were, that were more important to things like that. Uh, uh, Decision-making uh, more, what we would call our higher cognitive functions. Um, uh, so then beyond that, so obviously this was uh, uh, not, uh, satisfying or in, you were uh, progress is only made by unfortunate accidents by people who then later had clear deficits to open up the brain. Um, so anatomic imaging was desired. So uh, even though uh, x-rays are not used uh, commonly today for functional imaging, uh, they it's worth mentioning that also in the late 1800s, uh, uh, the use of x-rays uh, was discovered basically uh, if you uh, have a cathode and electrode and have a high voltage in between with the, the uh, vacuum tube uh, and then put a piece of metal, essentially you'll have electron acceleration you know, through this or high speed electron bombardment of this metal. In this case, they use tungsten, which then releases X-rays. X-rays, of course, are high energy rays that um, uh, pass through certain things, don't pass through other things. And you can then, obviously, he was able to demonstrate with the phosphorescent screen that you could actually see your hands or or whatever. So, so that actually was the beginning of radiology uh, for the most part, and that was a huge breakthrough. Uh, There's other less breakthroughy sort of things that occurred. Um, people tried to apply X-rays to looking at uh, 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 the brain, although the CSF was sort of dense, and so that sort of interfered with the contrast of the brain. So people would often get their CSF trained uh, uh, to, to enhance the contrast in the brain when looking at x-rays. This obviously didn't catch on too well. Um, it was pretty invasive. And, and another technique that didn't catch on very well um, uh, was developed by Antonio Igas Moniz. Uh, basically, it was, it was the first um, arteriogram where you, he was a, experimenting with high density substances that he would put into the blood that would uh, interfere with x-rays. And he had some success only after killing a bunch of animals and, and actually a few humans in trying other substances that were high density. Uh, he came up with this, uh, which was a, kind of a breakthrough. This was brand new information uh, that was able to be seen. Uh, didn't really catch on too well. Um, okay. And then uh, uh, um, as far as uh, uh, looking at, you know, x-rays, how they advance, then you, you have, uh, if you had x-ray going all the way around with CT scanners, with, uh, with rays and uh, detectors, uh, essentially, uh, William Oldendorf uh, uh, developed this method called computed tomography. Uh, Hounsfield implemented this, uh, the first CT scanner. Turns out Hounsfield won the Nobel Prize for it. Oldendorf uh, did not, I don't think. Um, yeah. And so uh, there was a little bit of controversy in that, but I think that, uh, that yeah, that was a, a medical breakthrough in that sense, being able to image planes then uh, uh, with CT. Um, so, and then, uh, okay. So then we go on to uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. So before MRI, uh, there were people working with nuclear magnetic resonance for years. And it was very useful to look at chemical properties. Uh, uh, molecules would have resonances uh, depending on their bonds uh, that you could actually, you could actually look at uh, their, uh, their peaks uh, as a function of their frequency and infer, if anyone has taken organic chemistry or biochemistry, uh, you know all this, uh, infer their chemical structure from the relative peaks. And back in the 50s, uh, Pan sort of uh, launched this by, uh, launched the very beginnings of MRI by developing what's called a spin echo. Typically, magnetic fields were too innovative uh, to image uh, 
you know, any sort of substance. So a spin echo was basically an RF pulse, a 180 RF pulse that refocused. So the spins were processing, they were becoming dephased as they're experiencing different magnetic fields. But then if you applied a 180 pulse that flipped them, they would process the other way essentially and refocus at a spin echo. So he developed the concept of a spin echo. He also contributed to our understanding of the most important relaxation qualities of, uh, of spins. And I'm not gonna get into any NMR, just this is just a quick overview of sort of the main people and the main times for some perspective uh, of looking at T1, which is the, the rate of time that it takes once you excite a spin to for that magnetization to return to equilibrium. And T2 is the amount of time it takes once you excite it to become de so dephased, uh, even with, even with uh, the spin echo, that you can't see it anymore. Usually T2 is much faster than T1. Only in water for CSF does T2 start to approach T1, but it's still uh, much, much faster. Much, it's much more rapid effect for T2. All right, so finally uh, in 2003, but they developed this in, about, in the 70s, uh, Sir Peter Mansfield and Paul Lauterberg uh, won the Nobel Prize for developing MRI. And essentially, they did two things. One, uh, they put a person in this, or they, they put objects in the scanner, and they both developed independently, uh, somewhat independently, ways of doing image reconstruction using magnetic field gradients. So if you apply a magnetic field gradient uh, on top of the large magnetic field, then uh, water molecules or protons will be processing at different frequencies depending on the magnetic field gradient that you have. And so that will spatially uh, stratify the spins or the, the, the frequencies. And so by doing a, uh, in this case, uh, Paul Lauterberg did projection reconstruction. Uh, Mansfield did a, 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 another technique that allowed you to get uh, two dimensions. Uh, they were able to make these images uh, for the first time using the combination of gradients and magnetic fields uh, of, of objects. And so that was a huge breakthrough. And uh, so this is, this is Lauterberg's approach, essentially using sort of a method adopted from CT uh, called back projection. So, so they would adjust these gradients in 45 degree angles or, or, and, then, and then do a, re a line reconstruction and then from that uh, to an image reconstruction, which was kind of like what's it's done in CT. Um, uh, Mansfield actually uh, applied a gradient and realized that the inverse Fourier transform or the Fourier transform uh, of that is the image itself uh, because you, you get rid of all these interference patterns. Uh, if, you have, if you have an object that has a gradient placed over it and you look at the, the frequencies, it's all mushed into sort of one interference pattern. But if you uh, take the Fourier transform of that, you actually get a spatial distribution of where the frequencies are coming from. So, uh, so Mansfield did that. Uh, and for that, they won the Nobel Prize. This other guy, uh, Damadian, was really close, but he didn't quite do that. And there's a lot of controversy as to why he didn't get the Nobel Prize. And part of the reason why is because he didn't really have uh, it wasn't this elegant uh, reconstruction method for his images. He had, he did, you know, put a body in a scanner and did the same sort of RF and uh, it was a magnetic field and uh, used resonant frequencies. However, he didn't have a linear gradient. He actually had a very nonlinear gradient that had one point that was a resonant frequency. And then he would physically move the subject around until you made the whole image at that one point uh, frequency. And that was pretty kludgy, um, although there's an argument that uh, you know he probably should have won the Nobel Prize with them because the concept, the general concept with there wasn't quite as elegant, but, um, but he didn't. So, uh, uh, and that's, an, that's a picture of his first cross-sectional image uh, right here. He also claimed that, which isn't quite as true as it was thought, that the, the T1 relaxation of tissue revealed cancer. So he thought, well, this is a great way of revealing cancer in the body. Uh, so that was an image. It took, was painstakingly reconstructed by moving the subject around and applying RF pulses. But you can get something. This is the cross sections of the body. Um, all right. So 
This is essentially what Omega looks like today. It was invented in about 1977 um, and introduced clinically in 84 and just took off. There's uh, over 100,000 MR scanners in the world today. And fMRI, I like to always mention that fMRI is very lucky that we have so many scanners that can do, that are useful, so clinic, or clinically useful that um, uh, that could also be turned into fMRI scanners. You know, it's not the case with MEG. It's not the case with uh, PET scanning. Uh, there's limited clinical use for that. So the technique themselves it, itself is sort of limited. Whereas with MRI, there's machines all over the place. And that really helped fMRI. All right, hemodynamic and metabolic imaging. Uh, we can go way back to the 80, 1880s again to this guy. There's a whole book written about this, uh, Angelo Masso. And he had this idea that when the brain was more active, he had the intuition that it would fill up with more blood, you know, as it was becoming more active. And it's it's true. Uh, I don't know exactly how, you know, it's. I think it was recently verified that the net weight of the brain becomes maybe a little bit higher. Although CSF also rushes out as the brain fills up, but that's another issue. Uh, he had this balance, a super sensitive balance, which had a subject lying in the scanner or lying on the balance. And as the thought harder about things, uh, this would tip up and their, their head would tip down. That was the first suggestion that, that there was um, uh, some sort of a, a hemodynamic effect in the human brain uh, from this balance. But uh, even around this time, there was way more sophisticated work being going, going on in animals. And I always have to mention this, this uh, Roy and Sherrington paper was, was totally way beyond its, way ahead of its time. Uh, this was actually measuring on the surface of animal brains or of mouse brains or other, other animals, uh, uh, a way of measuring blood pressure or the expansion of the brain uh, or blood, blood volume essentially, but it was in, related to blood pressure. And here they were looking at the sensory part of the cortex and, and stimulating this, the, uh, a nerve. And, there, and they basically find this sort of signal change that, you know, you can imagine that looks exactly like an fMRI response uh, that they were seeing uh, way back in 1890 uh, with, within uh, this device. So that was very sophisticated work. And uh, it's, it's, you know, was way ahead of its time uh, that suggested a hemodynamic effect. During this time, of course, there are all kinds of other things going on. Phrenology was a big deal. Uh, this is a, uh, a phrenology device that quantitated your surface of your skull uh, at, um, and they were trying to infer personality traits or intelligence or things like that from the bumps of your scale. And so they had a very quantitative uh, method for doing this. And that's just, it's kind of an illustration that, that quantitation is not really uh, the best thing if, if you're not, if your quantitative values are meaningless. Uh, so they're very good at, you know, they had people come and get their brain or their skull uh, accurately measured so they could get their personality assessed. So uh, a lot of interesting things like that going on. But, okay, so let's fast forward 100 years about, uh, or 90 years. Um, this was the first, these are the first results of actually looking at brain activity. And it was using what's called xenon inhalation. Um, it's a radioactive substance that you inhale, it gets in your blood and uh, and essentially, you put your head up against uh, uh, right here, which was essentially a scintillation counter. It countered radiation, and it mapped it as well. And so, on a on a on one hemisphere or one on that, their hemisphere, you could map out the density of radiation or where it accumulated. And what they found was that you know very nice activation maps with uh, with language and reading and hearing things and so on. And I remember actually seeing this, uh, this work uh, uh, when I was in grade school and high school and, and being, or grade school actually, and being very excited uh, by it. Um, and then came along PET scanning. So PET, uh, uh, without going into any detail about what the, what the principles are, essentially you have uh, uh, isotopes that you can create either with a cyclotron, well, with the cyclotron or a generator. And uh, these isotopes can be put onto molecules, uh, like water or uh, other lig or ligands and, and other sort of molecules like neurotransmitters or other things. And essentially they uh, decay. They release 
uh, the, the, release energy uh, in the form of uh, photons that go uh, opposite directions. And um, uh, using coincidence detectors in the PET scan that detects that only records a decay emission uh, event uh, when they're simultaneous uh, uh, across the two detectors, uh, you're able to map out uh, essentially uh, where they accumulate. So that was a, that was a breakthrough in itself. And PET scanning evolved from, you know, sort of not very good images in 1975, uh, pioneered by uh, Michael Terabagrosi and Hoffman, Michael Phelps, uh, that they had the first PET scanner. And then finally, 1995, they start looking a lot better. This is, um, uh, I'm pretty sure, looking at water uh, here or just perfusion. Um, so then finally, you have uh, a nice result by Stephen Peterson, 1988. Uh, not that long ago, and not lo that long before fMRI began, of uh, hearing words, hearing words, seeing words, generating verbs, speaking words. And so uh, really nice uh, changes uh, in the amount of accumulation of, of, of the isotopes uh, with PET that occur. And this is the first time that, um, that I mean, in this decade was, uh, or maybe in the two decades before, they knew that the brain became meta more metabolically active, but this is the first time that they actually were mapping out uh, uh, some form of metabolic activity with the brain or some form of hemodynamic changes with the brain, just mapping it in this way. Uh, sure, the xenon CT was was there, but that, that could have been uh, sort of indirectly related to neuroactivity, whereas, whereas this was you know, clear evidence that there was something going on. All right, electrophysiologic imaging. Uh, once again, it all starts sort of in the late 1800s. Uh, uh, Richard Catton measured uh, currents between the cortical surface and the skull. Uh, it was sort of invasive. In 1924, uh, Hans Berger uh, developed EEG in humans, uh, first characterized alpha and beta waves. Alpha waves are related to sort of being relaxed. Uh, beta waves is more relaxed, I, I believe, and there's other things like that. Um, uh, so they were able to detect uh, uh, electrical activity at the surface of the skull. And about 50 years later, uh, MEG uh, came along, magnetoencephalography. And it started with this guy, Brian David Josephson, who you may have heard of Joseph and Junctions. And, the, and the, the, the essential concept there is that if you have two superconducting wires um, and a thin membrane in between, then you actually, any sort of change uh, in the voltage anywhere near the wires will induce a, a current. They're super sensitive to any sort of changes in voltage. So uh, that was uh, the conceptually advanced uh, early on. But then uh, uh, 1970, James Zerman invents uh, squid devices, which are basically just injection wires, you know, that could be put on the brain and then, uh, uh, on the skull. And then in 1972, the first one sensor, MEG, uh, started out uh, with squid. Um, Superconducting su super quantum interference devices uh, with David Cohen. And now we've advanced to, uh, you know, these, this is a standard EEG uh, receiver, and this is a MEG with, you know, 256 or even more uh, uh, squids. And there's other, there's other approaches to doing this as well, but, um, it's even more approaches that are uh, uh, that I'm not going to get into uh, that are more recent uh, uh, as well. So, but that's it's great at detecting. You know, EEG detects electrical currents at the surface of the skull. MEG detects magnet magnetic fields at the surface of the skull. They both are looking at at. Uh, I'm not purposely not giving like a background in detail what they're what they're measuring, but they're measuring essentially uh, coherent. Um, uh, current going through neurons, either that's that's either perpendicular to the uh, cortical surface or or per, you know at various angles to the surface of the skull, uh, depending on how your gyral folds are, and whether your gyral folds are perpendicular or parallel to the skull. Uh, one technique is uh, MEG is will pick it up, and EEG might pick up uh, the other. So they're. They're somewhat complementary in that regard, although GE, e, EEG suffers from a little bit more electrical connectivity uh, variation with the skull, whereas MEG doesn't have to worry about that. All right, so now functional MRI. 
Uh, so I have, yeah, I can give you more information about functional MRI because it's been my career for since the early 90s. And uh, I like to bring out this paper. If you really want to read a nice, uh, a really nice history of some of the development of functional MRI over the over 20 years, uh, this was published about a little bit over a decade ago. Um, uh, take a look at this because it's not only the science, but as, as it was mentioned, the science and the stories, it's sort of like personal accounts of all the people developing functional MRI uh, methods. So there was a, a big effort throughout the entire field. This is a this is hundred people, 103, I think, uh, uh, all talking about their contribution to fMRI method development. Uh, there was a lot that went into it. Um, and before fMRI, so what's, what's kind of interesting is that I always like to show this paper be, uh, when I talk about histories because this, this was published in Science in 1990, like just before fMRI began. And it was called Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging in Medicine and Physiology. But as you can see here, there are a lot of sort of functional techniques. There's metabolic imaging, there's, uh, there's diffusion, there's angiography, there's uh, perfusion imaging, uh, there's even metabolic spectroscopy, uh, uh, which I didn't even mention, uh, but, but there's no fMRI. So this was uh, just before the beginning of us functional MRI. Oops, five key, not key uh, factors. So there were five things that were involved in that were really, uh, I think, kind of lucky uh, that were involved in the discovery and use uh, utility of fMRI. And I'll go through each of these. So magnetic properties of red blood cells. So it turns out that uh, uh, way back uh, with Linus Pauling, so in 1936, Linus Pauling discovered that red blood cells changed their susceptibility, which is their, the amount that they're able to concentrate magnetic fields, uh, depending on whether they're bound to oxygen or not. So if they were not bound to oxygen, uh, they were uh, more paramagnetic than if they were bound to oxygen. If they're bound to oxygen, they were, I mean, red blood cells are diamagnetic either way, but they are they were diamagnetic like the rest of tissue. So they're kind of invisible magnetically uh, uh, when they're bound to oxygen. But once they become unbound, you have free electrons and that uh, focuses the magnetic fields. It causes field distortions. And the field distortions cause uh, spins uh, to process at different frequencies, which causes dephasing, which causes the signal to go down. So in areas where there's hemorrhaging, where there's deoxygenated blood in the brain, you see the signal dark, these dark lines. And that's because it's, there's more paramagnetic blood there. So this, this was uh, discovered in, by Pauling, of course, before there was MRI. And then in, in 1982, Thulborn uh, discovered that there was uh, a T2 dependence of blood and Ogawa showed those dark lines uh, as he modulated blood oxygenation that they would disappear and appear. And then also Bob Turner here at the NIH uh, did experiments in cats where he would shut off the oxygenation to the cat and the signal would go down. Uh, and basically um, this is just an example. So Linus Pauling was, this is in his paper and he actually says, well, even, even back in 1845, Michael Faraday tried to characterize his susceptibility of blood. He only had it in powder form. He didn't use fluid. If he had fluid, he would have discovered that it changed uh, susceptibility with oxygenation, uh, you know, way before, uh, you know, almost hundred years before uh, it was discovered. And so he was sort of criticizing Faraday for not, you know, doing what he said he was gonna do. So he said, you know, he said, he mentioned that he was gonna look at fluids, but he never did or maybe he didn't. Uh, this is Keith Thilborn, uh, who, who also, like I mentioned, pioneered uh, looking at T2 change. And he actually did two things. And one thing that was really important. One, he characterized the T2 of blood, the transverse relaxation with blood as a function of oxygenation. First time it was ever done. Uh, and secondly, he actually showed, okay, so this, this X axis is, is a measure of, so when you're measuring T2, sometimes you have multiple 1R, uh, uh, 180s. And if it's pure T2, which is a mechanism that I'm not gonna get into, so like more of like a dipole-dipole interactions, non-susceptibility. 
uh, then this curve should be flat. Uh, it should be completely independent how you space the timing of the 180s. Uh, in this case, it clearly went, uh, it went, it changed with the spacing. And that was a proof that it was a susceptibility, a bulk susceptibility effect, distortion of magnetic fields causing spins to spin at different frequencies, not some sort of interaction of the spins directly with the blood molecule. So that was a big deal, that it was, it was a susceptibility effect. And then you had Ogao who came along, who, oops, there you go. Dr. Gordon's, oops, gosh, now what is it? Okay, okay, two. All right, back to meeting. Okay. Ah, uh, uh, where? Oh, oh how far? Or right side. All right, here we go. All right. Um, Okay, then you had Ogawa who came along, who uh, coined the term bold. He was the one in his PNAS article uh, that came up with the term blood oxygen level dependent contrast. And this was it. So he had uh, rats at seven Tesla, uh, breathing 100% oxygenated air. And if you do that, your veins even become a little bit more oxygenated and the signal is totally flat. There's not much contrast because the blood, the red blood cells look diamagnetic like the rest of the tissue, no distortions of magnetic fields, everything's great. Uh, but then if you have uh, breathing room air, like we all do, uh, what happens is as the blood goes through the brain, uh, the metabolic rate of the brain pulls oxygen from the blood, reduces the oxygenation uh, you know, a certain amount, and that causes venous blood to be slightly deoxygenated. And that shows up as dark lines. So he showed this for the first time in 1991, or about 1990, between 89 and 91. And he also showed it in test tubes that uh, when you had 100% oxygenated blood versus deoxygenated blood, there was not only a decrease in signal, but there was this a little bit of, of a penumbra that would occur. Um, and essentially it was uh, field distortions, not only around the red blood cells, but around the tube itself that uh, affected the big, uh, basically this, you can look at this as a magnetic field. And if you have a blood that's susceptibility, that it's, it's, it has a different susceptibility surrounding tissue, it would create uh, field distortions as a function of the angle of that vessel to the magnetic field. So, and then like I said, Bob Turner and Denis Lebihan, Denis was also developing diffusion imaging. And Bob was trying to show that, that this effect that he saw was bold contrast and not diffusion. And so he, essentially, this is a time series of difference images uh, subtracting from right here when they started to they cut off the oxygen to these these unfortunate cats and um, uh, the signal basically goes right down in gray matter uh, and that's just all the blood's becoming deoxygenated and then once they turn it back on there's this overshoot and it becomes oxygenated yeah so uh, very simple experiments but very amazing and profound at the time uh, all right, activation related to hemodynamic changes. So uh, this paper was the, was the first functional MRI paper ever published. So this was some work by Jack Belleville, uh, presented in 1991. Uh, young, he won the Young Investigator Award uh, in ISMRM, or called SMR at the time. And basically what he showed was uh, during resting state, this was a, if you inject a bolus of gadolinium, so this wasn't using blood oxygenation, if you inject a bolus of gadolinium, it rushes into the blood, rushes into the brain after uh, a few seconds, maybe uh, yeah, about 10 or 15 seconds, and, and then it decreases. Uh, then it causes signal decrease as it washes through because it's, it's paramagnetic. And basically when it's in the, in the bloodstream, all the spins that are experiencing this slightly different magnetic field due to the paramagnetic gadolinium uh, get defaced. And so by mapping the integral under this curve on a voxel-wise basis, he can make a nice measure of resting state blood volume. And so what he did was he stimulated the brain, uh, did it again, and sub uh, subtracted the integral under these two curves to come up with a, an area showing increased activation of the visual cortex, a blood volume effect. And that made the cover of science, made a big splash. Uh, this was science, published in November of 1991. 
So his colleague, Ken Kwong, uh, was also just putting people in the scanner, shining light in their eyes without any contrast. And so this is the, the MGH gang. There's, uh, I won't name all the people, but basically this is Jack Bellamo and this is Ken Kwong right here. Bruce Rosen was their boss. Um, and so Ken's experiment was, everyone agrees is pretty much the first experiment with fMRI where uh, he, and it was really a good, a really good paper because he not only looked at uh, uh, blood oxygenation changes, this is graded echo images, a time series. Uh, he was looking at that, but also looking at uh, inversion recovery images, looking at T1 changes, not T2 or T2 star changes. And the idea he had there, which is also one that Alan Koretsky had, is that that perfusion, which changes T1, pure blood flow rushing in, perfusion rushing in to the brain, uh, changes the T1 properties. It's uh, basically fresh blood that changes T1. Uh, and you have that effect right there with the simulation. He also compared it to um, uh, visual stimulation rates. So this is uh, frequency rate, and it basically peaked around 10 hertz, and this is what you found. So uh, here's his notebook, essentially, uh, just to highlight that this was May 9th, 1991, uh, was his first successful experiment, and here's the activation. Uh, he also had, you know, uh, the original block design, bold contrast, CBF contrast, so it was a great paper. The Minnesota group came out relatively close after that uh, at four Tesla, in which they looked at extremely high resolution using a multi-shot technique, uh, higher, higher resolution, um, and basically showing this post undersheet as well, showing the signal grew with echo time. Also kind of an indirect proof that it was susceptibility uh, related contrast. Uh, so, but the reason why you need echo planar imaging, so we typically do all functional MRI with echo planar imaging. And what is that? That's where if you give an RF pulse to image it, Typically, you just collect one line of what's called case space, one line of raw data space at a time or two. Uh, with echo planar, you collect the entire plane uh, with one echo. So uh, with one echo, you're just, you just drive the gradients as hard as you can to collect the signal before it dies away. And that, the advantage of that is that one, it's fast, and two, it freezes all physiologic motion. Uh, and so you can make these movies of really, really clean images as far as that's concerned. And it makes a big noise. That's what you hear in the scanner, that, that loud beep. That's this frequency of the gradients oscillating back and forth. And all scanners that do fMRI now typically do echo planar imaging or variations of it. So MGH had this system that had a resonant gradient amplifier. Uh, Minnesota had, uh, they used multi-shot. Uh, and at Fort Tesla, they still got it to work, which was surprising uh, that because there's a lot of artifacts that occur from shot to shot, but they got it to work. Uh, I was at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and I was lucky enough to be kind of in the right place at the right time working with a, a fellow graduate student who helped uh, make the, the basically uh, a program of echo planar imaging and made the grading coil to, uh, it was Eric Wong to, to do uh, high speed imaging. And uh, we got this going with a very low inductance that could switch very rapidly uh, grading coil. So there's Eric and myself building the grading coil out of super pipe and wire, uh, me modeling the grading coil, a second version of it. And uh, something that you'll never ever see today is just placing the coil on the, on the, on the table and putting it in. Uh, there's no safety committee that would approve of that ever. <laughs> Even though it was pretty safe, there's a chance that, I mean, I wouldn't approve of it probably if I were on the safety. I am on the safety, but I, I probably wouldn't approve it. Um, uh, because if any of these wires actually shorted, uh, the coil could torque and that wouldn't be good. Um, yeah, that's potentially unsafe. So right now, when they have local head grading coils, they're all potted in the, in the magnet and they're, they're, they're not going anywhere. Um, so our first experiment was we, we just could collect one slice. So we collect a really thick slice uh, over the motor cortex. Uh, and uh, one little known fact, though, uh, is that the whole world could have done echo planar imaging back then. Uh, we didn't need a local head grading coil. If we were happy with typical PET resolution, five millimeters cubed, we could have all been doing echo planar imaging and doing functional MRI 
since 1984, but we, but we didn't. So, uh, but we had the gradient coalescing go to about three millimeters resolution, which we thought somehow was important. Um, uh, uh, in retrospect, that was kind of an interesting, uh, you know, it was good that we did that, but we didn't totally need to do it. So here's our first images on my paper. There's a movie moving left hand, right hand. We didn't have any statistics back then. Um, so, uh, and one thing that was interesting that also a little bit of tidbits of history that um, in, in Ogawa's, one of Ogawa's papers in 1990, he actually was pretty prescient because he said, well, you know, this blood oxidation measure could be used to look at brain function uh, potentially. And that was useful. But when, what threw all of us off, uh, it threw me off is because I was actually looking for signal decreases with activation because he said in his paper that the activation region uh, could show darker lines or you know a decrease in signal with activation, which makes sense. Uh, you know, it, on some, if you think about it for a second, it's you know increased metabolic rate pulls oxygen from the blood becomes darker, and it only occurred that. Uh, um, uh, there was a paper by Peter Fox. And so the whole time, like when I, with, for my first results in 1991, uh, September 16th, I was I kept on seeing signal increases. And I had like a question mark, like what? The signal goes up. That's weird, but it goes up in the right spot. So it must be real. It's all motor cortex. And, um, and so this paper provided the essential clue that the, the signal should go up. And it was a paper published uh, in 1985, uh, 1985, yeah. So it was already published uh, by Peter Fox. And it was the one paper that really helped explain everything. Um, that basically he was doing PET scanning and he showed that he was measuring uh, uh, CMRO2, the metabolic rate of oxygen consumption. And he was measuring flow or perfusion with PET and looking at those two simultaneously with visual simulation or motor simulation. And he found that in fact, uh, the oxygen extraction fraction went down during activation. So he his paper was the first one to say, oh, you know, sure metabolic rate goes up a little bit, but there's this huge overcompensation in flow that occurs that causes the oxygenation of the blood to go up in that area, not down. So that was the one paper that uh, much of uh, you know, that we could kind of now go forward with confidence saying, okay, this is why the FRI signal, the bold signal goes out. And so this is the final, this is the, not the final, but this is the, the cascade of, of what we think happens, you know, activation, you have dilation, increase in cerebral blood flow and volume, oxygen delivery exceeds metabolic need, you have increase in blood oxygenation, therefore also a decrease in deoxyhemoglobin. And because of the parapagetic properties of that, you then have a decrease in susceptibility related intervoxyl dephasing, which causes an increase in T2 and T2 star um, uh, rate. So, so not the rate, but the, the, the signal goes up and a local signal increase in these sequences. And so that's, but it turns out then there's, a, there's still all kinds of questions that are even present today. This isn't figured out by any means. Uh, one, there's many different types of activation. Do they all cause the same type of vasodilatation? We don't know. Uh, what's the mechanism between activation and vasodilatation? We also don't know exactly uh, how local and how consistent it is. This is something that we constantly are thinking of in the in the context of going doing very very high resolution uh, layer FI, and and we don't even know why it even happens really. And the thought was is that initially for the first twenty years is that an increase in oxygen would be to deliver oxygen to the furthest uh, neuron away because oxygen delivery is diffusion limited from the blood. Turns out, if you even cut off the uh, the uh, the ability for vessels to increase flow at all with activation, the neurons fire just fine because the decreased oxygenation that occurs and on the venous side is only about ten percent. Uh, so flow doesn't really have to go up to you know it can might go down twenty percent then with activation, but it's still a lot there. So there's papers that are coming out now saying, well, actually it's to uh, maintain homeostasis and pH or to remove waste. So the story's not uh, finalized as to what causes this. Uh, 
Um, of course, uh, these susceptibility effects uh, uh, occur on many different scales in, in interfering with quantification. And there's other things that may contribute to the signal change. Uh, okay, back onto the history. Uh, the first event-related fMRI uh, wasn't too far after uh, Andrew Blamier, Blamier from Yale. Uh, they had a local head gradient coil as well on the z-axis. And they did three-second stimulation. They didn't call it event-related, so they, this is sort of usually forgotten that it was even the first event-related experiment. Uh, that was 1992. And of course, uh, John Detra and Alan Koretsky uh, were the first to convincingly demonstrate perfusion imaging. Uh, this was also in 1991. Not like Ken did, where he was looking at perfusion changes just with an inversion recovery sequence. They developed a way for looking at uh, perfusion, uh, baseline perfusion, using uh, various combinations of, of tags and then allowing the spins to flow into the plane and then doing a control tag and then subtracting the two. And so they were able to get, uh, these images don't really look the best, but, um, but none did at the very beginning. Uh, so, you know, kind of perfusion images uh, and different amounts of perfusion with different amounts of flow deficits. So, so that was also occurring right around 1991. So all this stuff was happening all at that time. And two techniques that came out back then, uh, epistar, which is what I just told you, a tag below and a tag below, above, and then subtract, and then you make a time series of these subtraction images to get perfusion or perfusion changes. Uh, fair flow alternating inversion recovery, which you tag just on the plane and then tag everywhere and then subtract uh, as well. Two different techniques, they both work just fine. Uh, and if it turns out if you wait different amounts of time, uh, between the tag and when you image, uh, you have uh, you get the fast flowing blood here. This is like an angiogram, but then if you wait up to a second, you get really nice uh, perfusion maps of allowing the blood to flow into the tissue and seeing perfusion. Okay, so these are the first five papers in fMRI. Like I said, it was very uh, very lucky that uh, I was kind of in the right place at the right time to kind of be in there in the mix. Uh, there were some attempts at, at um, naming it. So what are we going to call it? So uh, fMRI just didn't just happen. Uh, in fact, this was one of the first meetings here in uh, uh, the Ritz-Carlton in Pentagon City in Arlington. There was one of the first meetings in functional MRI uh, before uh, everyone was excited. They said, let's meet. And uh, there, Bob Turner proposed MRFN, uh, Magnetic Resonance Functional Neuroimaging. And no one liked that. And, uh, uh, but he liked it. I kind of like it too. It stands for like more fun. So it's more fun for I. Um, uh, finally, fMRI came about. And uh, a little known fact that I actually just found out about a year ago or so um, that the first use of fMRI in a paper was would happen to be my second paper on, on uh, correlation methods that I, that I used fMRI. So I don't claim credit with, with uh, coining it though. But um, uh, so here at the at the NIH, there was um, uh, uh, this massive scanner that we had. It was a Ford Tesla, one of the oldie in the world. And this is Peter Gizzard, who was here, a postdoc of Bob Turner, doing some of the first fMRI experiments. Bob Turner also had a head grading coil. He had a Z coil uh, that he built, designed himself as well to do fMRI. All right. And he did a field strength comparison showing that it's higher with uh, a different field strength. I always, I always laugh at this paper, not really laugh at it, but I mean, I laugh at, I'm amused at the idea that, and they, I remember Bob was saying that he had an N of 15 in this paper, but it wasn't 15 subjects, it was 15 boxes. So one subject, 15 boxes, and, but that's fine. It was, it was a clear result, it was obvious, so that was good. Um, okay, the spatial scale of brain activation. Not going to go into too much detail, but I but I often think that there's no it's sort of a fortunate thing in nature that that the brain like motor cortex is sort of large enough. You know, you could have imagined in some other scheme that the brain could have been organized in some fine scale, which which where you wouldn't really see, uh, you know, a punctate activation that's large enough, or just or you know that's local enough to show activation. So because the brain is so modular, it was a nice uh, 
test bed for, for demonstrating that fMRI works. So we had motor cortex, auditory cortex, visual cortex, all clearly large enough to image with even the lowest resolution. Um, that was useful. You know, auditory visual, uh, very, very useful for us in this motor cortex. Um, it's also organized on, across many different other scales, uh, which we're only barely scratching the surface of. Most people who do neuroscience image at scales much higher than we can image uh, at the neuronal scale. But the brain is organized at the level of columns and also uh, layers. And fMRI is starting to approach that. So here's some, some early work uh, looking at columnar activation with Robbie Menon uh, back in 1997 at, seven, at four Tesla. And this is uh, uh, optical imaging results that show clear opt, uh, ocular dominance columns as well. Uh, and this is some work by Gang Chang in Neuron, uh, 2001. And, uh, and then here's, of course, uh, work that you'll hear about later on this summer by Renzo. Uh, finger tapping, as you go to higher and higher resolution, what you see is it turns from a blob, you know, right here, and it gets more and more detailed. And this is using a technique that's not old, but it's, it's blood volume, which is more localized activity, but we'll get into that later. Uh, at 0.7 millimeters, what happens is, is that you start to see these lines of activation. Uh, and that occurs more specific to each layer uh, of cortex. Uh, so we can actually get down there. Uh, I'm not gonna get into this work in any depth, but this is basically looking at motor cortex activation uh, at the layer level uh, with modulation of uh, finger tapping and what you see upper. This is actually looking across the cortical ribbon from CSF to white matter. And you see modulation of the uh, upper and lower layers. But let's say for instance, when you're looking at ipsilateral finger tapping, you see an inhibition in the upper layer and no activation in the lower layer. Um, sensory activation, you see activation in the upper layer, but nothing in the lower layer. So all seems like it's in line with what we know about how the motor cortex is organized. And with bold, you can't see quite as much because uh, there's some spreading with large vessel effects. Uh, these are all the neuroimaging technologies. Uh, all the darkly filled on in ones are invasive in MRI. This is why fMRI was so exciting at the time because uh, it was not invasive and it covered a huge chunk of uh, unexplored territory in human brain activation uh, that we're, we're still filling in right now with temporal and spatial resolution. And, and here's the chunk kind of in a different way. So on the left is the spatial scale uh, of the brain from whole brain networks down to uh, gene and protein, net, protein networks. Uh, we can cover all the way down to the circuits, about one millimeter. And uh, we can also cover temporal scales uh, based on the hemodynamic response that I'm not talking about today, uh, from you know everything from initial sensory processing all the way to long-term stuff like learning and plasticity. So it it's really a useful technique as far as that's concerned. Um, okay, and, and and the question actually is this is sort of like the debate that we have sometimes in uh, at the Society for Neuroscience, for instance, is that you know what is the the most relevant spatial scale for really understanding the brain. You know, some people are very much uh, uh, reductionists where they say, well, if you understand the neurons, you understand the neurons interact with circuits, you can pretty much figure out the rest. Uh, whereas we're saying, well, you understand the networks, you understand the circuits, and you can figure out the net, the rest. And so, you know, there's how, you know, which one is going to be the, the essential scale that will be most informative for principles of brain function. Uh, probably the, the higher scales, but I think our scale is still useful. Um, okay, echoplanar imaging, not gonna go into this too much, but basically it allowed, uh, it's basically going very rapid. Uh, you collect movies. And like I said, uh, and I'm not gonna go into detail here, but essentially if you collect what's called multi-shot imaging, as, as opposed to zigzagging through raw data space all in one shot, 30 milliseconds, if it takes 10 seconds to a minute, as typical MRI scanning does, you have what's called a lot of, uh, what's called phase errors, uh, misregistration of case-based lines. That if you're doing a 4E transform then in this direction, and the misregistration occurs because of your breathing and your heart rate is, heart is beating, 
then you might be moving a little bit. And that all causes the lines to not be perfectly registered. And if they're not, take the Fourier transform to, to make the image, you'll get this ghosting effect all the time, every single time. And even worse, you'll get a ghosting effect that changes every single image. So tons of artifacts, tons of noise, uh, it's slow. And that's why we need echo planar imaging, essentially. Um, so the approximate timeline of the development of, uh, of echo planar imaging, like I said, uh, Peter Mansfield conceived of it before it was even possible. Uh, in 89, uh, EPI of humans emerges, uh, various retrofits. Finally, in 1996, uh, EPI became standard at clinical scanners uh, and uh, parallel imaging uh, took off very high resolution. I should expand on this now. Um, uh, Submillimeter single shot EPI is possible. And then we have also other various versions that allow us to even go higher resolution. Um, all right, the prevalence of fMRI scanners. So I just like to say that because just to reemphasize that, you know, much of fMRI is just riding on the back of the vendors. And uh, there's a lot more could be, that could be done because right now fMRI is not a clinical technique. And so the vendors have very little energy that they spend on developing fMRI. Uh, but at the same time, we're really lucky uh, that we can just use fMRI on the scanners. So it's an interesting relationship between people who do research and the vendors who sell clinical fMRI scanners. And I think I'll just end with that's this slide. Um, well, actually, one more slide. Um, that I, my group is called SPIM, so I just put that in the middle because I like to position our group at the interface of what I consider like the four main pillars of fMRI uh, uh, development. And one is like the pulse sequences and the hardware. One is signal processing methodology. There's a lot of work being put into that. Another one is understanding what the signal means, interpreting the signal at a physiologic and neuronal standpoint. And a third, obviously, hopefully they'll all feed into uh, basic research and also clinical applications. The more you understand, the better your processing, the more sophisticated your pulse sequences, the better applications you can have, the better questions you can ask. So it keeps on, this, this is basically, uh, this is how things interact, I think, in the field. And like I said, I'd like to position our, our group in the middle uh, to some degree. And you know, there's many other developments that have occurred, event-related, retinotopy, resting state, which was huge. I didn't even get into that. Um, in 1985, after the dominance, I feel decoding and so on. So I should probably make a more complete map here, but um, but I just want to end it there, just to give you a quick perspective of neuroimaging and FRI. So if there's any questions, all right, thanks. All right, any questions? All right, good. Oh, that's okay. That's right. Um, you can always email the questions as well. And uh, um, uh, all right. And Good then question. the next class uh, will be on Tuesday. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Thursday, uh, somewhere down here. So we have a question about the chat. Uh, ah. It says, Have you ever thought about doing fMRI with different organs to see if there is any relationship between the brain and the rest of the body? Um, uh, well, uh, I think, well, it, certainly they've done a lot of bold imaging on like the kidney. Uh, they've done, tried to do bold imaging on the heart. Uh, and that would be interesting. I mean, it, you, I mean, you could do, you could look at increase in perfusion or bold or something with, I mean, I don't even know what the experiment would look like now, but, uh, <laughs> you could try to like change your kidney function with your brain or, or, or change your heart rate with your, something like that. But um could be interesting. Yeah. No, I have not uh I've not done that. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for coming. All right. <laughs> Very much. You have to click on more. Uh, more. Stop. 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 St